Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we focus on a new book by Patrick O. Kors of the University of Florence entitled The New Atlantic Order, The Transformation of International Politics, 1860 to 1960, uh, 1933, which will be published this July by Cambridge University Press. Joining us this afternoon as discussants are John Darwin, Emeritus Professor of Global and Imperial History of Oxford University, Gaynor Johnson, Professor of International History at the University of Kent, and Mario Del Perro, Professor of International Science at Sciences Po. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, here today along with my colleague Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times, in person, at the Wilson Center, and since the pandemic, here in the virtual realm. And after today's session, we'll convene another four times this month, including a session on Wednesday the 25th, before taking a break for the summer. And of course, we will return in early September. Behind the scenes, two people make these seminars possible. Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center, and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank our institutional and individual supporters. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. Information on how to do so will be in the chat function. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and will soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function not chat, but raise hand, or the Q&A function on Zoom. And to those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn the screen over to my colleague, Christian Osterman, who will introduce our guests and who will be moderating today's discussion. Christian, all yours. Thanks, Eric. Um, a warm welcome to all of you to the Washington History Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Patrick O'Course, who is Professor of International History, as Eric mentioned, at the University of Florence. He was an Associate Professor of History and International Relations at Yale University, a Fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and the Alistair Horn Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He's the author of two uh, acclaimed books, Un The Unfinished Peace After World War I, published by Cambridge University Press in 2006, and now The New Atlantic Order, The Transformation of International Politics, 1860 to 1933, also published by Cambridge. The book has already uh, uh, been published in Europe, but I, I guess we're awaiting publication here in the US. He also wrote about the Pax Americana, the United States and the remaking of global order in the 20th century in the Review of International Politics, uh, in uh, November 2018. I, I guess it's a welcome back uh, to the Wilson Center. Um, Patrick, you interned um, with us many, many, many summers mm -hmm. uh, ago. Um, so uh, it's wonderful to have you back and uh, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. And uh, first of all, I also would like to like to go back to the very origins of this uh, project and this book that are very intertwined with the Wilson Center, because uh, this is a book in its own right that I'm publishing now, but it's also part of a course, sort of trilogy in which I try to offer a new interpretation of the transformation of the international order and particularly the Atlantic peace order in what I call the long 20th century. And when I first started to think about this uh, project, and I didn't have in mind yet that it would take this shape, um, I had to do research um, in Washington and in, in the archives around here. And um, I was very lucky because it was still in the old castle, the Smithsonian castle that I uh, applied and had an interview for an internship and was then uh, sort of assigned to Samuel Wells, Sam Wells, who's since then become uh, a wonderful and very important friend and who um, I would like to uh, sort of uh, express my gratitude and all my appreciation uh, towards uh, right now. Um, so further, it is a great privilege for me to be here um, with these very distinguished commentators who also have a lot to do with the past and future of my project. Um, 
with John Darwin, um, I uh, sort of associate my uh, the early stages of trying to understand how the international and imperial system was transformed in what I now call the dawn of the long 20th century, so the years after 1860, and I couldn't have had a better yeah, mentor and intellectual interlocutor than John all these years um, at Nuffield and in Oxford. With Gaynor Johnson, uh, I, uh, we share a long-standing interest that goes back to the, to the last millennium, um, in the 1920s in particular, and Gaynor once organized a wonderful conference on the Locarno Pact. Yeah? And the Locarno Pact, of course, is at the center of my first book, The Unfinished Peace. And it also features in the in, in the epilogue of the current book, which is a, a kind of prequel, a rather massive prequel to the first book. Finally, with Mario del Perro, I very much look forward to exploring uh, main themes of my next book and research project on the Pax Atlantica after 1945, because I will be a, a visiting professor at Sciences Po this autumn. So uh, it is a wonderful setup. What I would like to do um, is to give you a, a brief sense of what this book is about, um, what kind of sort of perspective I want to open up with it, um, and how it relates to predominant ways in which scholars, historians have thought about yeah, both the question of why and how the international order changed so dramatically yeah, in the era of the world wars of the 20th century, and in particular, why it proved so difficult yeah, to build what I call a modern international system after especially the Great War, yeah, the, great, the First World War. Um, and what I'm trying to show in this book is that we, in order to answer this question in a way that goes beyond more old-fashioned, what I call blame game history. So who was responsible for the Peace of Versailles to have been not enforceable or wrongly made on the one hand? And on the other hand, uh, to explain why it was so unprecedentedly difficult yeah, to uh, create not just a durable peace system, yeah, a new set of rules, of ideas, of institutions to keep the modern world at peace, yeah, after this great war, um, this book suggests that it's not enough to focus on what often has been called the moment of 1919, you know, the Paris Peace Conference, or in Eris Manella's uh, very interesting book, The Wilsonian Moment. What I try to do is to situate this in a big picture, in a wider context, in what I call you know, the transformative context of the long 20th century. And what do I mean by this? In many ways, yeah, we live right now in a watershed period. If we think about the war, uh, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine, the, 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 the notion that we might be at the end of a time when certain understandings of what some might call a liberal international order or Atlantic system are being tested might even have been corroding and we might be at the end of something that was created, yeah, not yet after the First World War, but after this period of two world wars, one great depression, yeah, and that which then took shape in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, what I call a Pax Atlantica, an Atlantic peace system, in which the United States, of course, played a very prominent role, but in which you know, a, a basic characteristic was that it was not a kind of new imperial system or some system imposed by one new hegemon, but rather a unique and unprecedented, in my view, uh, cooperative, yet also very hierarchical peace system you know, that ensued after many false starts after many attempts yeah, at overcoming the inequities and problems of the earlier long 20th century that I will briefly talk about and to do something different. Yeah, so at the core of this book is the question also, what and how far can different actors, statesmen, state leaders, but also the wider public, yeah, all those who tried under modern conditions to gain an influence on peacemaking on the international order, on new ideas, on the League of Nations, yeah, and who all congregated in many ways in Paris in 1919, to what extent had they really learned lessons and understood what was to do, not just to build a new durable peace, but also, and this is a big question this book tries to open up a new perspective on, a legitimate 
yeah, peace, a peace system and order that was seen as providing the wherewithal, institutions, rules, inclusion yeah, of all the main players in this modern and transforming world and players that changed dramatically yeah, as a consequence of the First World War, uh, the pre-war era sort of viewing yeah, a predominance of imperial world states, we might call them, great empires of different kinds, especially your European ones, the British, the French, the Dominion, and, and the Russian and others, Japan coming in yeah, after the Meiji Restoration of the 1860s, which was more a Meiji Revolution to try to withstand this kind of pressure, but also a system in which the United States, though yeah, formerly an anti-imperialist and different kind of exceptional power, was pursuing, as I try to show, in the first part of this book, its own version of very expansionist imperialism, economically driven by other means, but having a major impact, for example, on China and many other parts of the pre-World War I world. So in this sense, yeah, my books tries to suggest that what dawned yeah, uh, was um, the long 20th century. And this is, this is it dawned when yeah, after um, sort of the breakdown of the 19th century international system, which is the system of Vienna, yeah, put together at the Congress of Vienna, very Eurocentric, instituting something like a European concert yeah, and new ideas for how to keep peace within Europe. When this broke down after the Crimean War of the, um, of the mid 19th century, and at the same time, yeah, massive, uh, massively important processes gained ground. So we have state formation processes. Yeah? So the German empire being founded, Japan being revamped uh, under the pressure of international imperialism. And of course, the United States being reunited after the civil war. Yeah? So this is the starting point. Uh, after the 1860s, we have all the, kind of the players that would eventually find themselves in fighting the two world wars of this long 20th century. Yeah. So as I tried to suggest in the first part of this book, this, these were dynamic developments. So states changed. We had the first true globalization also of economic and financial sort of dynamics, yet also a globalization of uh, what I call a globalization of power politics. So the idea that you had an almost unlimited kind of global competition yeah, where you had sort of... Um, civilizational Darwinist and other ideas and where the bottom line was that if you wanted to be in the top club, the top tier of the future world order, you had to be among the top world powers, world imperial states. Yeah? And this had dramatic consequences, partly as I tried to show, it corroded what was left of the European concert and it led to a constellation uh, by 1914 in which you did not have an assembly of sleepwalkers, but in my view, rather yeah, states that had found different ways to try to, to preserve their security, but they no longer had a concert system. So when uh, yeah, the uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, heir to the throne was assassinated, a local crisis, a terrorist crisis could escalate into a gigantic war because the main actors had unlearned <coughs> what they had to do to preserve peace. Yeah? They had ra they rather positioned themselves to fight a war within their alliance systems, within their compet competitive ways. So nonetheless, already, as the book also shows, before the First World War, you have many forces yeah, from the uh, Second International to Liberal Internationalist, uh, Legal Internationalist and others who saw the problems uh, yeah, on the horizon and who were trying to suggest that these major powers had to change their ways or there would be a catastrophic war at some point. Yeah? So these are actors that eventually would try to implement the kinds of ideas they had after the uh, sort of First World War. So then the book tries to suggest that yeah, rather than, as George F. Cannon famously said, seeing the First World War as the original catastrophe yeah, of the short 20th century, we should see it as a cataclysmic, but also catalytical uh, sort of um, catastrophe of the long 20th century, because a pre-war system broke down, yeah, all kinds of certainties and assurances uh, collapsed. And when the war went on, yeah, there was a new struggle, a major struggle between different ideas, 
conceptions for what kind of world order should emerge after yeah, this, this great war. And the main point the book tries to make in part is that this was a global struggle, yeah, and it showed that not just state leaders like Woodrow Wilson or George Clemenceau or the supreme command of the German army, but many others, yeah, professors, intellectuals, activists, the Women's Peace Party, League of Nations groups, they all try to have an impact on not just the outcome of this war, but also the outcome of what I call the war within the war, which is a political and ideological war. Yeah, so major expectations were raised as to yeah, this war, the greatest war up to that point, also producing the greatest peace, yeah, peace to end all wars, as Wilson famously put it. Um, and yet, yeah, what of course has to, then has to be explained is why did the Paris Peace Conference and the, the attempts to do, to do this yeah, in the end only produce a rather tenuous, frail, not so durable and especially not inclusive international order yeah, at the, in the summer of 1919 and in the, the years thereafter. So the book tries to suggest that and tries to show, um, this is now the fourth part, that yeah, we, we have to try to take the, the measure of the entire, the most complex peacemaking and reordering process in history as, up to up to the point of 1919 and ever since yeah there was it was never more complex there were never more actors questions problems yeah major challenges to be met than then at the same time yeah um this book tries to show that the this kind of peace conference is a crucible of more modern international politics because the key actors you know, were trying to make or set the terms of the peace, and those were especially the lead, the political leaders of the victorious powers, you know, Lloyd George and his entourage, Clem George Clemenceau and Woodrow Wilson, with many others that I, I cannot name them all here. You know, they, they did not only face these unprecedented challenges, how to relate to a Russia in the throes of civil war, uh, the Bolsheviks potentially taking power, what to do with the fledgling uh, Weimar Republic that yeah, wanted to have a seat at the table, claiming that they had now learned the lessons of the war and were yeah, writing a democratic constitution and wanted to be part of a modern post-war order. So how to deal with them, how to deal with the myriad sort of national self-determination and self-government claims in Central and Eastern Europe and part of the world that was completely yeah, rearranged and shattered where the old empires receded, but many imperial and uh, understanding still prevailed. And where, of course, you had numerous claims yeah, for uh, sort of reaching this one point that was so essential, that seemed so essential at this stage, namely to have a recognized state of one's own. Yeah, so the book tries to show those who were successful in this, for example, the Polish and the Czech and Slovak national movements, but it also reflects on all those, notably, yeah, and this is quite interesting nowadays, the Ukrainians who wanted a Ukrainian independent state at that point, yeah, tries to reflect on why and how some succeeded to be at the table and be recognized and others did not. Yet to come back to the, you know, the main protagonist, so what I uh, sort of try to illuminate here is that yeah, this process that was so beset by gigantic expectations in the end, because of the dynamics of uh, the, the process itself, but also because of underlying assumptions of the key actors, turned into a strikingly hierarchical <laughs> peacemaking process where a lot of the decisions were made rather top down by political leaders who yeah, did not only have to address all these issues that I mentioned, but in the end, also had to do something that is in the sort of an essential part of modern international politics. They had to find solutions, compromises, and justifications that they could use to, uh, to legitimize what they had done towards their own home audiences in very limited, but strikingly more, relatively more democratic force fields, you know, the British, the American, the French, and many others. Further, as this book shows, yeah, this is a time when you, you could not compartmentalize yeah, national debates. All of, the, all of these act, uh, tr sort of interacted transnationally. Yeah? So Wilson had a major impact with his ideas across Europe, across the world. Yeah? Um, but there were other influences that also trans transcended borders. And in the end, however, I would ar I argue in the book that 
yeah, one of the main tasks these peacemakers had was to craft a solution that was viable at the international level, yeah, for example, on creating a viable uh, League of Nations as the new anchor of the security structure, but at the same time had to take into consideration very different legitimation requirements. So just to, to mention a very famous one. So for French policymakers like Georges Clemenceau, who was not a nationalist or narrow-minded yeah, uh, revanchist, but a liberal policymaker who wanted guarantees, yeah, security guarantees that the kind of attack France, France had suffered in 1914 would not happen again. And so the debate would then you know, ensue whether the League could provide such guarantees. And as you know, in the end, there was a, yeah, a special guarantee agreement made. And it's French actors at this point who think of something that becomes the nucleus of the North Atlantic Alliance. They call it a North Atlantic security uh, community. So the book tries to show them that yeah, in, in two ways, um, many expectations had to be disappointed. Yeah? The nature of this piece was one of compromise, yet in one central aspect, it was uh, a highly yeah, um, illegitimate piece because in the end, it was enforced and forced on the vanquished powers and many others who had no say in making the terms yeah, of 1919. This not only, but especially concerned Vi the Weimar Republic um, uh, of, of Germany. The point, uh, however, that is a broader one and which now leads me towards yeah, the final kind of outlook and the arc of this book is that given yeah, that we cannot start in 1914 in trying to understand how massive the task of reordering was, but have to go back all the way to the origins of this hyper-imperialist you know, competition decades before, I argue that it was simply unrealistic to expect to make a stable, settled peace you know, at one peace conference that then you just had to enforce. You know, rather, uh, and this is something the protagonists of 1919 each in their own way understood, you had to lay foundations and you had to lay sort of gain, sort of create basic understandings and ground rules, how you would stabilize and pacify Europe, the relations of Europe and the United States, the relations of Europe and yeah, the, the completely shaken up Middle East the, and East Asia over time. Yeah? In Woodrow Wilson's uh, sort of um, perspective, the League was to be, yeah, the League of Nations was to be the central mechanism in which over time, in a new way, these things could be yeah, negotiated. He called it at one point a clearinghouse of the modern world order. For British protagonists like Cecil and also Lloyd George eventually, yeah, the idea that one had to, to create a more hierarchical new modern uh, Atlantic concert yeah, was very central. Um, yet the, the important thing here is that a lot of what was not yet possible in 1919, yeah, because the challenges were so overwhelming, was actually possible uh, during the 1920s. This takes us to, yeah, for example, the Security Pact of Locarno in 1925 and un other understandings in which, for the first time, the victors and the vanquished were yeah, negotiating ground rules. So finally, and I could say more about this, but I'll be brief. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest then is that we should see yeah, 1919 and the Paris Peace Conference as the first very limited but very formative attempt to create a modern Atlantic order yeah, at the core of a modern world order. Yeah. Then this starts a dialectical process of further learning, of further failure, and of further eventual advances that takes us from the 1920s, a period of remarkable achievements, not an interwar period that was bound to lead to the crisis of the 1930s, Nonetheless, a period in which not a kind of architecture could be created, not least because of American reluctance to make commitments to this, that could withstand the shocks you know, of the Great Depression and the world economic crisis. So further then, and this leads towards the next book I'm now writing and, and to the final part of the epilogue of this book, so pages 999 to 1005, yeah, what I argue is that some of the main lessons that led the Pax Atlantica of the post-1945 period to be more durable, more legitimate over time, have not just to do with the pressures of the Cold War, you know, the competition with the Soviet Union. It was important, 
but in the end are the result of longer term learning processes where you know, some of even the main actors, John Maynard Keynes, Jean Monnet and others who had lived through this period of massive wars, you know, for first hopes of, an, of a settlement, uh, disappointments, the rise of the extremisms of the 1930s would then at the end of what I call a 60 year peace process create new foundations, especially for a Euro-Atlantic, yeah, Western European order after 1947. This would be stabilized by the early 1960s. And eventually, um, we're beginning to think about how far this could be the central sort of element of a new liberal world order yeah, that it seemed after 1989 could now be created. And so the final question what could um, ask is, so what uh, was unlearned or not sort of sort of understood sufficiently after 1989 to allow yeah, the great hopes of the 1990s to turn towards the kind of yeah, international disorder and the fraying of order within the Atlantic community, but also outside it, that we now have to face up to when uh, an aggression like that of Putin is testing yeah, the very underpinnings of this order, not just the NATO security structure, but the way in which liberal societies, broadly speaking, respond yeah, to threats of this kind. And so my final question then would be, yeah, are we at the end of the long 20th century because these processes are no longer possible and we just see something collapsing? Or is this precisely a kind of yeah, rejuvenating crisis where some of the, yeah, not maybe not so charismatic, but nonetheless, yeah, work sort of work workhorse statesmen and stateswomen who are now in charge of in, of transatlantic and international affairs finally uh, will do something that is more similar to what, what what occurred in the 1940s. And I would be very happy to write a, a, a next book in which the long nine, long 20th century extends well into the 22nd. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Um, as you will see from the Q&A, um, there are already some questions looking at the most recent period, and we'll, we'll get to that, I assume, in the Q&A, and also with some of the questions um, by Mario, uh, perhaps, and others. Um, we have three uh, really wonderful commentators um, to take on this massive tome. Um, we, Given that it's not even out yet in the U.S., we've given them the... Uh, uh, a chance to take on whatever piece of it uh, they would want to, so that we, we don't expect everyone to, to, to talk about the entire volume. Um, in fact, all three of our commentators are working late, late hours in Europe. Uh, they're all based in Europe, so um, uh, we'll uh, want to get right to them. Uh, we'll start with Professor John Darwin. John Darwin is Emeritus Professor of Global and Imperial History at Oxford University. His main field of interest has been the history of empires, both their rise and fall. And in global history, that is the history of movements of people, goods, ideas, and formation across the world and across national boundaries. His particular focus has been on the ways in which empires exploit, adapt to, and are often disrupted by global movements over which they have little, if any, control. His books include after Tamerlane, The Global History of Empire, um, published in 2007, The Empire Project, The Rise and Fall of the British World System, 1830 to 1970, published in 2009, and Unfinished Empire, The Global Expansion of Britain, published in 2012. Professor Darwin, it's a pleasure to welcome you to uh, the Washington History Seminar and the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you very much. And I shall try to be as brief as possible, as I know we've got uh, several commentators and also we no doubt want plenty of questions and answers later on. Um, well, let me begin by uh, saying how, uh, how much I admire Patrick's book and how much I've learned from it and how much I've been stimulated by it. Um, like him, though perhaps in a slightly different way, I've long been fascinated by what one might call uh, successive geopolitical regimes across the world uh, and the reasons for their survival and very often their rather sudden collapse. Uh, it seems to me that if one looks at the core of what Patrick is arguing, uh, 
there is this very intriguing dialogue, one might say, between what he calls or describes, I think, as the learning uh, processes of statesmen, uh, their attempt to formulate or conceptualize the nature of the international order uh, in ways which perhaps become um, more productive or more, uh, more inclusive or more realistic or on adjectives one might think of, on the one hand, and what you might call the material realities of geopolitics, defined as the distribution of economic and uh, military power, on the other. So how do these two activities, you might say, the capacity or ability or will to conceptualize the international order, how do they play off against the also the attempt to understand the nature of geopolitical realities and how they may affect particular national or imperial interests. Now, I take it that Patrick, in a way, is urging us to think uh, very much in terms of or the, the learning process, the attempt, the attempt to conceptualize things, and indeed, shall we say, the difficulty of doing so in 1919 through to 1923, on which I very much agree with him. I suppose, in a way, if I'm going to perhaps be a little bit challenging to what Patrick argues, I would want to suggest that the geopolitical realities uh, in terms of, say, the distribution of military and financial power uh, may sometimes be seen, perhaps, as rather more important than any learning process. Mm. We go back to that original concept of Europe, which uh, he refers to briefly, and of course, which was described so brilliantly by Paul W. Schroeder. I think it could be argued there uh, that it's really, in a way, the distribution of power across the European continent which preserves that concert, including the peculiar role of British naval primacy in excluding European imperial revanchism from Latin America, as much as any shared or any, uh, any sort of ideological convergence among Europe's leading statesmen. And similarly, to go on to uh, a major point that Patrick makes about the world after 1860, where he describes the breakdown of those original concert ideas uh, at the time of the Crimean War, I think one could argue that despite ideological divergence that takes place uh, between the leading international statesmen of Europe, nevertheless, uh, there's a remarkable willingness despite the extension of European ambitions into the wider, what becomes the imperial world, there's a remarkable willingness actually to find compromise uh, between their different ambitions for territory or economic advantage, uh, whether in Africa or in Asia or other well, parts of the world. And uh, Salisbury's diplomacy, for example, and that of Bismarck as well, two leading protagonists, you might say, of this alongside the French, uh, strike me as being efforts to find ways of heading off at the pass uh, the demands and avarice of vested interests within their own countries in ways that will avoid any serious inter uh, international conflict uh, between themselves, which might endanger the equilibrium in Europe. Now, when we turn to think about, you know, the men of 1919, uh, and why they were unable, as Patrick uh, says, I think quite rightly, to find ways through uh, all the competing uh, considerations that stood in the way of a, you might say, a general agreement around how to frame a post-war international order. It certainly does seem to me that he is right in seeing that the number of competing issues is so enormous for the leading statesmen, the ones who had the resources to actually reframe that world, because there are many actors who did not have the resources to do so, of course. Uh, when one looks at all the competing issues they had to consider, it is hardly, I think, surprising in many ways that it was impossible to frame any coherent order that was going to actually last the race. If one thinks simply from a, a British point of view alone, I mean, after all, the British were one of the three major powers who had the resources to advance a particular kind of international order. They confront not only, of course, colonial problems, problems in the Middle East, problems in East Asia, problems confronting them economically, the threat of revolution from Russia, uh, the threat of also of a general imperial 
uh, collapse at certain times, as it seemed to the more excitable members of the Lloyd George government. One could argue in a way, actually, that the real problem in 1919 to 23, and even later into the 1920s, is that perhaps in hoping to frame an international order, uh, the men of 1919 were in many ways far too ambitious. Uh, they couldn't hope really to construct an international order with so many sort of competing difficulties to actually to, to, to overcome or simply to manage in ways that would uh, you know, relieve the pressure, particularly upon uh, straightened military and financial resources. This is an issue for the British, it's particularly acute, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that they rapidly demobilize their army and then confronted by so many crises around the world with an army which was shrinking literally by the minute. So perhaps it is in many ways the, the, the sheer scope of the problems they confronted and also perhaps the excessive ambition which they were encouraged by various very influential commentators to uh, their, their ambitiousness which they, were in, which they were encouraged to embark upon this reframing of the world that really lay behind much of the incoherences, it seems, and errors of, you know, of the period. And my last point really is, if one goes on, I mean, this Patrick encourages us, I think, to do, to think about the, um, the failures of this period, contrasted with what seems like the successes of the 1945 period, on, after 1945, the creation of an Atlantic order. One might say that perhaps the real success of the Atlantic order after 1945 was its comparative, uh, shall we say, uh, comparatively modest ambitions. Mm. In fact, that it's really um, uh, actually a very, a very almost defensive order, which only aspires to reach across part of Europe and then part of the world, rather than attempting to impose a real world order. Because after all, very quickly it emerges that the power of the Soviet Union and of, indeed of uh, after 1949 of a revolution in China, <laughs> they're going to restrict the scope for a Euro-Atlantic rule-based order very severely indeed. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, perhaps it's only since 1990 that we've rather perhaps reimagined that post-1945 period in much more ambitious terms mm -hmm. than it really was actually in, in, uh, in, in, in that earlier period. Mm -hmm. Let me conclude by my three questions, which I want to pose to Patrick, which are perhaps slightly deliberately provocative. I wonder whether perhaps the real sine qua non of an effective concert, something which could have come about perhaps after 1919, was that there should be an overwhelmingly strong conservative coalition, or at least one committed to enforcing a particular set of rules, as did exist after 1815, uh, whether that was actually, without that, any kind of uh, effective European, let alone world order, was really condemned to failure. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I was very struck by what I thought was a very interesting analogy he drew in the book between the position of France at the end of the First World War and the position of Austria or the Austrian Empire or Austria-Hungary, perhaps, uh, after 1815. And where we, you know, I'm, so my question in a way is, um, if we reimagine Clemenceau as a Metternich, <laughs> which perhaps... Uh, meant that um, Clemenceau wasn't able to play the extraordinary role that Metternich did. Was it a defect of his outlook? Mm -hmm. Was it really the effect of, his domestic, of France's domestic politics? Or was it the fact that unlike Clemenceau, he did not have a fully powerful, available conservative coalition with which actually to work? Mm -hmm. And finally, last question, was actually a precondition of the Euro-Atlantic order that came into effect after 1945, a substantial dismantling of the British Empire as a competitor with the United States, and we might say as a distraction from a concentration upon the European scene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Durham, for these excellent um, comments. Um, over to you, Patrick, for our initial response. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this somehow strangely feels like a Nuffield seminar, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, I thank you very much for these very piercing, but also, you know, very stimulating comments. 
in in a way, I think you um, outline some of the kinds of yeah sort of dimensions I want to illuminate in the book that makes makes it rather make it rather long because yeah if if one goes tries to go beyond what I call blame game history, where you look at defects or particular failings of people, you have to understand the context and the room to maneuver and to see what was actually possible. What did they imagine was possible? What can we conclude in analyzing the constraints, the, the situation yeah, in retrospect? And the book tries to do both. It tries to yeah, sort of illuminate these questions from two angles. And let me start by um, just uh, reflecting for a moment on yeah, so there, um, I had a, a discussion not so long ago in New York with Adam Tooze, who wrote a very uh, provocative and interesting book called The Deluge, in which um, I think a much more st straightforward claim is made that it is because the changes in the underlying power structure of economics and finance that the world order changes and the US replaces Britain um, as the sort of yeah, leading imperial hegemonic power. So I think that's a very interesting point. But to me, um, how can this explain the shortcomings and the question, yeah, the, the, the question of why Wilson and others were not in a position to, let's say, impose something like a Pax Americana based on yeah, the kind the fact that they were the creditor powers of others, they had far more resources, yeah, they had all these pieces assembled. And this is where I suggest we need to be aware of these power realities, the geopolitical, geoeconomic realities, both as actors saw them at the time, because what they perceived mattered often more than what we conclude in retrospect. But also, uh, we have to be aware of how did they actually want to use this kind of power? Yeah? And this is where we get to learning processes that yeah, the case I'm trying to make is to, to, to look at Wilson and his entourage as actors who had relatively little experience and training and exposure to complex yeah, processes that the actors that um, are very uh, high up in John's books, yeah, the British uh, sort of those who are generations of policymakers and leaders who had to manage a very complex global system, yeah, more than an empire, it's a global imperial system. Mm -hmm. So Wilson, uh, in, in particular, confronts the ch some challenges of his own making. He raises immense expectations for fundamental change and, th and, and argues that the kind of enforcement, the kind of yeah, committee that John was outlining is no longer what a modern peace requires. Yet when he's in Paris, he has to actually engage in very complicated, yeah, messy, sometimes negotiating processes with other interlocutors like Clemenceau who don't accept this logic and who, like Tardieu, uh, that's the main strategist working with alongside Clemenceau, say, no, we need to have yeah, uh, like a, a basic security structure, yeah, or a sec kind of security council within the league to make sure that yeah, whatever happens, we are united. Yeah, so in uh, as Paul W. Schroeder shows before the Congress of Vienna, the allies, those who would make the peace, had basically reached common understandings before they even came to Vienna. Yeah, in 1919, there is nothing like this. So it's an extraordinary situation where these different actors, more experienced, less experienced, meet for the first time and have to work out these very complicated questions under circumstances where yeah, you have an immense public uh, interest. Yeah, there, there are demands for open diplomacy. There are demands for yeah, uh, righting wrongs and uh, creating new states. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, um, uh, having reparations uh, yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that compensate for the sacrifices of the war. So massive demands. And I think all of this you cannot explain both what impact this had and what kind of peace you could make by simply saying, in the end, this all was you know, dictated by the United States being now the most powerful you know, economic player in the world. Um, it does, of course, later matter that by 1945 and thereafter, yeah, the, the role of the United States in terms of the world's economic and financial cloud has skyrocketed. This is a superpower yeah, st uh, sort of status. Mm -hmm. Yet, nonetheless, if you think of actors like Cannon, Etchison, many others, they were now trying to think of ways of translating this into hegemonic leadership, political leadership power. 
And in my view, they were more creative, not so conservative, <laughs> but more creative in some ways than their predecessors were. Yet, if you think about this, yeah, the book tries to show it's, it's, it's not just Wilson yeah, or certain elites on the East Coast. It's American society that has to deal with the big question, how do they want to interact with the wider world from now on? Do they want to play a leading role? Do they want to make commitments in the League of Nations or not? Yeah? And this debate only starts yeah, around uh, Paris. And the big treaty fight yeah, in the American Congress is just the first kind of iteration of a long battle, a struggle that is ongoing as we speak. Yeah? And, and I'm in Washington right now, and we could, we could easily identify the, the polarizing uh, different opinions. So this would be sort of, I think, these. I'm trying to answer two of your questions in, with this, <laughs> with this uh, um, excursion. And um, yeah, finally, um, I think, yeah, so to come back to yeah, the, the longer durée uh, perspective, I do think you're absolutely right in pointing out that after yeah, the uh, Second World War, because of the constraints that led from the original Potsdam or Yalta idea of what this world should be, more centered all around the United Nations, the four policemen, yeah, Roosevelt's sort of visions towards something more concrete, yeah, gives it a certain conservative texture. Nonetheless, I would argue yeah, this idea that there is a nucleus, a Euro-Atlantic nucleus for something much bigger is something you find in almost any of these thinkers and you already find in Wilson. Yeah? So Wilson in 1919 uh, would argue, we first now have to create a League of Nations of the Western victors. But this is only the beginning, yeah? because mm. there are also universal conceptions. If you're talking about self-government and all the rest, yeah, mm. that have to now be either filled with life or anyone who is against your kind of yeah, uh, approach will accuse you rightly of hypocrisy, of double standards, of saying something that's supposed to be global and universal, but really having a very hierarchical conception at the core. And if one thinks of Marshall's, for example, ideas of including the Soviet Union in the Marshall Plan and so on, we see much broader visions, but then under the, yeah, the, then under the constraints of the Cold War, <laughs> there's this concentration on the Euro-Atlantic sphere. And we have the, uh, we could talk about the East Asian system on the other hand. And finally, Yes, very much. Yeah. So one of the big themes of this book is in a way, yeah, if you think of big histories of the long 19th century, like Jürgen Osterhammel's or originally uh, Eric Hobsbawm's, yeah, this is a world of, in the end, empires and imperial power states. At the end of this war, yeah, you still have the British system, the, the French, and you have German thinkers geopolitical thinkers, a young Adolf Hitler, who think in terms of having to build the conditions for a, a German super empire to compete with them. What I'm trying to show is how far it was possible to replace this kind of international order, not by new super empires. You know, if you think of John Gaddis or other Cold War historians who basically just take the next round, I would say, and talk then about a big conflict between a more benign American super empire and a more evil or not so evil uh, Soviet empire, I'm trying to look at the question, how far could Atlantic understandings yeah, be actually the starting point for a new modern system of states, but, but also to show then how hierarchical this was yeah, and how many of these aspirations of people outside this Atlantic sphere were rebuffed. Yeah? Uh, in 1919, you have Gandhi, you have Ho Chi Minh, you have other Patrick. actors on the ground. And I, I'm stopping here, but this is the, yeah, so, so the big intervention here is to think more carefully about what we actually mean by the modern international system, not an, a new imperial system. Yeah, thank you. Good. Uh, excellent. Uh, I do want to make sure we get, uh, have sufficient time for our uh, two other commentators. Um, with that, I'd like to bring uh, Professor Gaynor Johnson into this conversation. She is professor, professor of international history at the University of Kent in the UK. Her most recent publication relate to the history and operation of the British Foreign Office and the use of prosopography as a research tool for international historians. She has also published widely on 20th century British foreign policy. Her most recent book is Politician and Internationalist, Lord Robert Cecil, published in 2013. She's currently writing books on British ambassadors to Paris during the era between the two world wars, as well as institutional history of the Foreign Office. Gaynor, the Zoom room is all yours. 
Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and it's a great pleasure to see Patrick again after, after a great many years as well. And thank you also to the Wilson Centre for, for the invitation. Um, I must admit, um, some of the things that I was going to ask you about, Patrick, and talk to you about were, I've been, you've already covered to an extent and, and some of the things obviously you've, you, you've, you've said in response to, to John's comments as well, but um, I'll perhaps probe them a little, a little bit more. Um, I also find myself in a slightly frustrating situation with preparing these comments and as I broadly agree with you, um, there wasn't much that I I'm could I'm sorry read. about that. I, I, I do feel for you. <laughs> <laughs> that I sort of sat there thinking, you know, um, I wish there was something I really felt strongly about, you know, that I, I, I disputed. But there's a few things. Um, I just, a few general questions, general points. Um, you see the First World War as pivotal to the establishment and um, consolidation of the, the new US order and I'm, I'm not you know I think I, I entirely ag agree with you from that what intrigued me is your period between 1860 and 1914 what do you think the United States wanted to get from Europe in that period um, what is she looking for in terms of I mean it struck me about because obviously you've just been talking about imperialism and empire mm -hmm. and it, it's the of the um are the Americans learning how to be imperialist from the European powers who are already imperial? So that's something that, that kind of came out in, in, in my thinking. Um, and so how, what, and what forms would that imperialism take in, in that period? Because obviously once you get, it's the earlier part of your 20th century um, analysis there. Mm -hmm. I was also, I also liked your analysis of the League of Nations. Predictably, with me, you would expect me to look at the 1920s um, yes. uh, primarily um, in this. And um, I, th I thought what you said was very interesting. And I like the fact that you moved away from this rather relentlessly negative view that we tend to have of the League of Nations about failure and the mm. liberal ideas not really, you know, living up to, to, to expectation. And I wanted to ask you a bit more um, about, because obviously, as you know, I wrote a book about Robert Cecil. So, yeah. he, you know, it's a subject very close to my intellectual heart, whether you could tell us a little bit more about how you see Wilson's imprint on this new order emerging from the you know the middle of the first world war on, on to into the 1920s and what your take is on wilsonianism as mm. as a concept mm -hmm. um if you, if you wouldn't mind um so other things that struck me and again this is you know resonates very much with my own own thinking the new diplomacy and mm. the new diplomacy what kind of forms do you think it takes how do you think your analysis adds to our understanding of the new diplomacy, because my own work tends to suggest it, it's it, it, a lot of it is a lot of propaganda yes. um, and, and the, there isn't necessarily as much substance to it yes, as <laughs> like Wilson and Lloyd George would like us to think there is. So I'd like to know your, your views on that. Um, looking at the new diplomacy, I, I'm also interested in this idea of the interwar period or the 1920s and early 1930s anyway, as being a period where you have a tension between the old diplomacy and the new diplomacy. I mean, mm. the, the old diplomacy doesn't die. You know, it's supposed to be replaced, but it, it, it lingers on. And I wonder whether you think that some of the tensions in the 20s stem from the fact that you've got this tension all the time of you know, opposing forces pulling the international system in in different different directions. Yeah. Um, the so those are those are kind of my big questions. Um, I read with great interest, not surprisingly, probably here to hear your your, your chapter on Locarno, and mm. I was particularly interested in what you had to say on that. What I thought was really um, important about this was the way you integrated the the, the thought of um, uh, Charles Evans Hughes and mm. and his role, and also the fact that you pre um, pre sort of described the the Locarno negotiation security with the London Conference on Reparations because mm. that tends to get overlooked a lot. So mm. I think that's I think, but I think a general point is the way you bring in the character personalities of the different secretaries of state in that period and that we don't hear enough um, about them. So I think that's a really major 
a uh, contribution to, to what we have on that. Now, obviously, Charles M. Hughes is very important, um, but also his successor, um, Frank Kellogg, uh, 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 as well. And I'd like to know more about what you think Kellogg's vision of the world was in terms of, you know, how he gets involved with the kellogg Rion Pact. Mm -hmm. Is he an Atlanticist? Is he an internationalist? Is he a globalist? Um, I'd just like to you to, you to tell me a little bit more ab mm. about that. And, and also, um, again, going back to our, the way we know each other intellectually, um, but going back 20 years almost. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> a, long, a long time. Um, is, you know, obviously you've, you wrote this book um, on the consequences of the, of the First World War. And I was just wondering what, what the kind of intellectual journey you've been on between writing that book and producing the book that you, that you have because I can see I can, there is obviously there's going to be a certain amount of of overlapping theme but to me this is a much more uh, and I say this with great respect to the other book a, a much more sort of mature I mean this is a, somebody who studied this for a lot longer than you had been able to back in, the, in those days. So I'd like to know a little bit more about your intellectual journey between that book and, and the one you're doing now. And also to hear a little bit more about what you think the themes are that you pursue in the book that we're talking about this evening mm -hmm. will, will, will emerge in, in, in volume two mm -hmm. uh, and how your, your global vision of, of the Atlantic order will emerge. So mm -hmm. those, are, those are my thoughts yeah. at the moment. Right. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaynor, for these yep. for these comments and questions. And maybe Patrick, you can yes. weld some of your responses to you know the. I think I, I think I will have to because I, I I will have to be the main challenges. They're so rich and could lead me into so many uh, directions that I will try to be as brief as I I can and to string some things together. But so to start with, um, so I my intellectual journey here uh, is sort of going back higher, bigger, yeah, so it's, it's trying to be outward, yeah, it's trying to, to gain towards the bigger picture that I was trying to conceptualize in the first book, but I was a doctoral student, I had some guidance uh, from John and others, yeah, or some interlocutors who were pointing me in certain directions, but I think one of the big challenges nowadays, and this is a very serious point, is that yeah, especially also in the United States, and I was at Yale for a long time at, at Harvard, is this idea that you, yeah, you, the young stars have to do the early work and have some big thesis. And I take a much more, uh, let's say, conservative view there. And for me, especially Paul W. Schroeder has been a, an exemplary uh, scholar in that way, who built up his yeah, sort of understanding of the world and then wrote the ultimate mature work. This doesn't always work, but he, he did it. And, and this, these are the kinds of books that I think far more stand the test of time than a lot of the big yeah, hype books that then are soon forgotten and are of very questionable substance very often. So... I, what I've tried to do here is then to yeah, go back in time and to, for example, so you asked about the pre-1914 era. Yeah? So I think it's an intriguing, yeah? so the book tries to suggest that yeah, there, there was a rich uh, sort of realm of relations between the United States and, and uh, Europe and Britain in the global imperial context and both an imperialist kind of new vision. Uh, if you think of uh, Joseph Chamberlain, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the idea that you have, you know, the most civilized powers being the policing powers and basically not abandoning imperialism, but making it more rational, yeah, making it more sort of workable under the guidance of you know, the, the Anglo-American powers in particular. If you think of the open door uh, sort of yeah, introduction in China, going away from closed spheres of influence, you know, having a sort of, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a post-imperial vision, it's, a, it's a, an improved kind of imperial vision. They at some point thought of getting the Wilhelminian, the German Empire, into the act because they also thought in terms of a sort of Protestant and yeah, sort of rising and falling nations uh, sort of categories. Yet I've tried to show that this is a kind of world vision that had its moment, but then it didn't evaporate, but it didn't come to pass. And this had something to do with yeah, the kind of constraints they faced in their own societies, where you had a lot of actors already before 1914 who were questioning this kind of imperialist outlook and who were trying to do something quite different before 1914, namely to build a kind of Euro-Atlantic empire of law 
Yeah, so the Hague Conventions, uh, all the attempts to civilize, to legalize, to get away from yeah, brutal power politics. Um, and at the forefront here, these are global developments, are American and different European actors. So there are many transnational sort of, you know, uh, links and movements already. And yet we have to explain why in the end, for all the wonderful things they did and the Congresses they had and the Hague Conventions, all of this does not work or prevent yeah, the, the Great War. And then we are in a different tra 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 trajectory. So now to Wilson, one, I think, very important point the book tries to make is that I do not see Wilson at all as a liberal internationalist. Yeah, there are internationalists at this time. For example, Jane Addams, a, a leading figure of the Women's Peace Party, she really tries to gain an international perspective to take in different perspectives and not to sort of have an American lens on the world. Wilson, by contrast, to my mind, is a progressive but also hierarchical Americanist. Yeah, so he is he basically um, has a conception of the world that's 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 a kind of an analogy to how he sees the United States. And then he wants to Americanize, in his view, the world. Yeah, so the League of Nations is a, is a kind of um, a attempt to build an American structure. But, of course, he gets most of these ideas not from the United States or U.S. intellectuals, but from British intellectuals. So there is a kind of process of acquisition and reshaping uh, the, that goes on. Um, and Wilson adheres to yeah, a kind of language uh, in which you will never find the term international or internationalist. He will talk of American, but also uh, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say global or um, yeah, uh, sort of general principles. And this is, of course, an old code of language in the American, US American political language. Yeah? So Wilson is someone who, in the end, is very, in my view, did, does not undergo a turning around of the mind because of the Great War. Yeah? So he, he had earlier been a liberal imperialist, sort of saying the US had a civilizing, civilizing mission in the Philippines. And by 1919, he's still thinking of. Yeah, the league having to be constituted by the most advanced yeah, uh, powers. And he obviously had written uh, earlier as a young, younger professor that in his view, only the Anglo-American Protestants were truly capable of self-government. Yeah? So there is a very hierarchical structure here. Um, so to move on uh, towards the 1920s, um, yeah, this is a... So, this book is sort of written towards my first book. Yeah? So there are, you know, my basic understanding of the, the, the importance of the uh, settlements of the mid-1920s as in Europe really constituting the foundations of a, of a more forward-looking piece already developed in the first book, but now I've tried to put them into a global framework. Yeah? And so this accentuates, in my view, what Sarah Steiner's great works on the lights that failed have already done in a somewhat more conservative, I would say, cast of mind, but with, with which I generally agree, namely to get away from this thinking of this interwar period, yeah, the uh, a period of illusions and of things that, of course, were bound to fail and were bound to lead to the rise of Hitler. This is far from the truth. And there's a, there's a rich understanding to be gained from the what I call the post First World War era. Yeah, so it's an open process. And if you go, go to the Europe of 1928, in which Kellogg is negotiating the Kellogg Briand Pact, there is an outlook that finally the world seems to turn have turned the corner. Yet, as I'm also trying to show, yeah, this is uh, also a period where a lot of, let's say, understandings of having one's cake and eating it and having it again yeah, uh, are, are reigning supreme, uh, especially in the, in the United States, uh, where Kellogg would suggest that it's wonderful have a, to have a pact that outlaws war, but that has no sanction mechanism. So if anyone yeah, violates this pact, then there will be moral opprobrium, but there will not be any real consequences. Yeah? And, and similarly, in which a lot of JP Morgan and other financiers thought that they could manipulate international politics according to their interests without having to, yeah, to push Congress in the United States to make commitments, such as, for example, joining the League of Nations after all. Yeah? So these are the kinds of certainties that then when a real crisis hit, yeah, the world economic crisis, make this system less uh, robust than it could have been. And I would even draw some comparisons to yeah, sort of the kinds of things people have said about Putin until about two months ago. 
yeah so that one can work with him that one makes some deals that you have a minsk process yeah these things are only revealed as completely inadequate when the real crisis occurs and this is what happened in the in the 1930s um with a view to the euro atlantic um, uh, sort of uh, area finally then yeah i i'm not suggesting that this is a nice linear tale of lessons learned and positive developments after 1945 yeah it's a much more complex history um but nonetheless i do think that if we want to understand what underpinned yeah the nato order and the the kind of european recovery program and the us support for european integration in the west and so on it's not enough just to say well this these were just new imperial strategies the united states had too much capital and so it had to create these things there's much more going on and this and the, and, and what that is yeah these 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 long kind of reorientation processes that um that that is what the book uh, finally will be about yeah the next book the pax atlantica yet i always also want to situate it in a global context so i've i've promised my editor in cambridge that the next book will be a really substantial one you know finally i will i will really <laughs> try to do that <laughs> and, uh, yeah because i do think it's very important to give you just one example if you look at atchison or cannon yeah they have a whole picture of the world where they look at certain centers of power in east asia and in Europe and then there is the rest of the world but there's also the rest of the world and we cannot just focus on one strand of this and neglect the other and i think one of the big problems nowadays in uh, in in almost all universities especially in those that don't have so many resources is this compartmentalization yeah you focus on certain regions or you focus on certain actors you write books about transnational actors but not you're not interested in the the state actors and so on this book tries to suggest and that's why it takes a while to write it that you have to get the big picture where you uh, realize that all of these actors are in one world <laughs> yeah but they have different means of influence they have different means of power they have different requirements of for example ga gaining legitimacy if you're an advocate for the league of nations you can say i have the most perfect blueprint here and this is this should just be implemented if you are Woodrow Wilson you have to find a blueprint that you can negotiate with congress if you will are willing to negotiate and so on yeah so in my view this modern sort of conception of politics yeah which has a lot to do with language and yeah and and again i said a lot of talk and yeah sort of uh, this is part of the politics yeah there there's a new kind of public sphere that is changing at this time as well um and eventually um i think we are still in an era where this this kind of war or the struggle yeah where there's a there's an openness about which is the best way forward and and uh yeah and 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 we we've seen recently i think many instances where especially in the old sort of you know in britain and the united states uh, the idea that you have any kind of fact related uh, debate in this realm almost went out of the window and what, this of course has major repercussions around the world because you have other leading uh, sort of leadership deciding that this is a period of weakness of disunity of complete yeah, disarray of those who were supposed to enhance the euro atlantic order and i think this has a lot to do with what we now face in what people nowadays call the systemic competition look at china look at russia yeah right. years ago we had the german counter model for a while also and the bolshevik counter model yeah so there are there are there are big arcs that that we we can trace yeah in this thank in this you pat <laughs> this actually this conversation uh this exchange has added a lot so so thank you thank you both but i want to finally bring into this conversation mario del perro he's professor of international history at sciences po paris where he teaches courses on the united states in the world the cold war and the 20th uh, 20th century global history among his many publications his most recent ones are uh liberty and empire translating there uh in italian um, liberty and empire the united states and the world 1776 to 2011 um published in 2017 the obama era from hope of change to the election of trump um published in 2017 and the eccentric realist henry kissinger and the shaping of american foreign policy published by cornell in 2009 before joining sciences po professor opera taught at the University of Bologna, held fellowships and visiting professorships at the European University Institute, the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress, Columbia, New York University, the Graduate Institute of International 
um, studies in Geneva. Um, he's a leading European transatlantic public intellectual who frequently comments on current affairs. And so I'm very much looking forward to your comments here today. Mario, over to you. Thanks, Emilio and Christian. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I'll try to be you know, <laughs> very quick in my comments. Um, I, reading the book, I, I came to the conclusion that Patrick is a very, very serious person, a very serious <laughs> guy. He takes a uh, 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 methodology very seriously. Uh, so there is a lot on, on methods. He takes concepts uh, very seriously. And so there's a strong, you know, conceptual uh, dimension. Although I'd like you, Patrick, to elaborate uh, a bit in your uh, uh, response on the on a key concept, which is legitimacy, which you use a lot. And, and my question very simply is, uh, uh, who uh, and what defines uh, the legitimacy of a world, uh, of a world order? Uh, Patrick takes uh, interpretations and chronology very seriously, and he, he offers a very bold uh, periodization of the long 20th century uh, a slogan uh, which Giovanni Arrighi has used uh, in the past. And somehow I think it echoes uh, a bit H.G. Hopkins's uh, book on the American Empire, or at least uh, that's what, uh, that, that's what uh, was my reading. Uh, and he takes historiography very seriously, I have to say. Uh, so much so that in the end, uh, I think the ambition of this book is to offer a sort of historiographical grand uh, synthesis uh, in which uh, the diplomatic, the transnational, the domestic, the role of global and national public opinions, rules, international law, they are all there. Uh, uh, although the emphasis is on power, and if you will, possibly more on the diplomatic moment and the big three, but all, the, all those dimensions um, are there, and I enjoy that a lot, because somehow you did not just bridge subdisciplinary fields and approaches that often struggles to dialogue one with the other, but you use them all. Uh, um, so, put it simply, I enjoy the reading a lot, and I learned a lot. I think it's a great book. Um, and I think it's, uh, well, going back to what you were saying about second books and first books, it's a book which will, you know, stand uh, the test of time and we will be using it uh, a lot. I have, I had, you know, many, many questions. I'll, you know, I'll reduce them to two or, or, or three. Uh, now, uh, being mostly a historian of the Cold War of post-1945, mm -hmm. uh, I was instinctively and constantly compared World War I to World War II, the World War I, the post-World War I transatlantic order yes. to the post. And it seemed to me that somehow the first was propedeutic to the mm -hmm. second <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's what you will argue in the follow-up. I assume partially so. Mm -hmm. So my first question is on the limit of the first uh, transatlantic order. Mm -hmm. And can we say that somehow a key precondition, a strong ideological cement mm -hmm. produced by a total ideological opponent translated into a sort of existential threat mm -hmm. did play a role. That ideological opponent, that existential threat was there, was considered to be there Let's say 1947, it was still not there in 1919. My second point is on the hegemon who did not dare to speak its name and to act accordingly, the non hegemonic hegemon, mm -hmm. namely the US. Uh, mm -hmm. Rightly, and several occasions, you mentioned the role of the domestic public opinion. You know. So, wasn't World War II? somehow more effective as a peda as in pedagogically mm. effective in preparing the American public for that kind of hegemonic responsibilities. Mm. And also, you know, basically teaching Americans to what the world was and was uh, about. So put it simply, 
Mm-hmm. The pedagogy of World War II was not yet there in World War I to prepare the American mm-hmm. public to accept the commitments. Uh, a true hierarchical transatlantic order imposed uh, the U.S. Uh, to uh, accept. Mm-hmm. The third question, you focus a lot on the vanquished. And, you know, the, a, a real effective order, you say, I think you, you use the, uh, the term, it must be integrative. It must be capable of integrating. Mm-hmm. Although post-World War I, it was not just the vanquished. There were also many yeah. victors, right, yeah. who were not satisfied with that yeah. order, which considered that order not to be integrative enough. I mean, mm-hmm. Indeed. of course, Indeed. Italy comes to mind. I mean, the myth of, strange, the mut- yes, but yes. <laughs> of the mutilated victory, I mean, even for the French, for many mm. French, uh, yes. was uh, uh, clearly there. Speaking of how propedeutic one was, the first was to the second, so to mm. speak, that's a, a forthcoming, a question for your forthcoming book, but mm. it seems to me that the first one somehow laid the conditions for the creation of a true transatlantic elite or plural mm-hmm. for transatlantic elites you mentioned in your in your presentation in your opening uh, Jean Monnet and many others somehow the League of Nations but also many informal mechanisms of cooperation mm-hmm. on the US European uh, 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 route so to speak formed trained created new yes. transatlantic elites on mm-hmm. which the second transatlantic order, Uh, could effectively rely, uh, Mm -hmm. which played a key role. I think, of course, of the work of Patricia Clavin on the League of Nations, Mm -hmm. which applies also to the the transatlantic order. Mm -hmm. And finally, and I stop here, race is a bit absent Mm -hmm. uh, in your uh, your book, whereas this transatlantic order had in race an important common denominator. When, in, when Dean Acheson met with the US Senate, senior senators explaining why Italy had to be included uh, in the North Atlantic Treaty, and uh, no one wanted Italy, you know, and uh, but, uh, he explicitly and uh, repeatedly mentioned race, civilization, and religion as some key elements linking Italy naturally to this new transatlantic order. So I just wonder whether Yes. What, what, what will you make of that? Thank mm-hmm. you. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we could do an entire seminar on this, but uh, so let me let me begin at the at the end briefly because uh, I hope that be, I hope it's become clear in my in presentation, but also in the first part of this book. There is, um, you know, I, I do consider race a lot, but I try to understand the terms that actors used, and a lot of them. So what I've uh, I've I, I rather use the terms civilizational hierarchy and civilizational Darwinism, because these are not just racial um, attributes. Yeah, there are, if, you, if you have actors like Theodore Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, Salisbury, many others, and, and other generations, they have certain mental maps of the world, of the hierarchies, and the race is a factor, but so is religion. Yeah, for example, if you think of Salisbury, yeah, it's the it's the Protestant culture, or if you think of Theodore Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, they write histories of the United States that show it's the it's not the racial factor, it's what they what the performance of the Protestants that shows yeah that they are uh, sort of equipped to uh, run the world and so on and so forth. And I try to show yeah that these. Uh, assumptions were partly challenged through the catastrophe of the war, but of course they were also partly very much sustained. Yeah, and they and they are the backbone of yeah Anglo-American negotiations. Uh, for example, vis-à-vis Japan, vis-à-vis all the other powers, they are they're shaping their views of France and the relative weakness of French political culture. Yeah, that's not so much racist; it's cult, it's cultural, civilizational. And finally, Wilson has a lot to say about the relative weakness of the German political culture yeah and the the the, the attempts that germans made to uh, get rid of the kind of wilhelminian yeah old regime yeah all of this is not 
yeah, racist would be too narrow, but there is, there are racial connotations that lead exactly to what you um, described earlier, that a lot of those who were even among the relative victors in Europe, in Italy, but also those who had helped these empires win the war, yeah, were reconsigned to inferior positions, the Indian National Congress and so on. And John has written about this in a much more, yeah, in a much richer way than I have. I've tried to uh, uh, systematize this, yeah, and these kinds of assumptions um, are, are changing, if at all, very gradually uh, in the mid 20th century, or what I call the second half of the long 20th century. So, if you have, yeah, figures like Atchison and others, uh, they have not become egalitarians and so on. Yeah, these these would be unrealistic expectations. So. Uh, the very important question, yeah, and this is the, the book starts out with this, yeah, is I'm trying to suggest that part of the big challenge of modern international order is to find a new global, a new world system that can be considered legitimate. And this is not a question of it being legitimate all and once and for all, but as I try to suggest, we have to look at the kinds of processes, yeah, not in a very linear and very political science-y way, but in the sense of saying, so what are the conditions for legitimacy? Yeah, so, and, and I have a few that I try to outline uh, with a view to the Paris Peace Conference, but they also will eventually uh, be applied to the kinds of settlements that were made after 1945. And after 19, uh, sort of 18, uh, you pointed to this. One of the interesting challenges is that yeah, I would argue that the First World War already uh, reaches this existential level. So if you think of the ideological war yeah, the, between civilization and German culture, between the, the British ideas of uh, uh, beating Prusso-German authoritarianism and so on, these kinds of, and the German responses and the Russian responses and so on, yeah, there is an escalation of Ideolo ideological struggle that then in 1919 makes it very difficult for them to recognize each other as potential negotiating part partners in a kind of compromise. Yeah, And French uh, actors like Clemenceau still use the kind of argument that you cannot even make any equal Treat, uh, equal treaties with Germans because of their predilection for imperialism and so on. Yeah, so these these categories are used all the time, um, and we have the new dimension of the Bolshevik. Yeah, sort of uh, sort of uh, threat, basically suggesting that all the things that were attempted at Paris are just uh, yeah, the last throes of a, a doomed kind of liberal capitalist system that is soon going to yeah, break down, uh, and yet they too have to realize that. They are relatively powerless, yeah. So they are, they are, they are, they are in a position to, in the end, prevail in the Russian scenario. But if you think about the grand aspirations to take the revolution, yeah, first to the Weimar Republic and then to Paris, yeah, this is being used by a lot of the peacemakers to for, to various ends. But in the end, this is not nothing that materializes. Yeah. Yet nonetheless, we already this is an ideologically driven peacemaking process yeah so the idea that you can do something yeah sort of disinterested or let's say interest driven real political compromises yeah becomes ever harder because you have to do much more you have to you have to create a peace that that fulfills aspirations yeah and these are all dimensions of legitimacy yeah so it's the process is it inclusive uh, are the people actually negotiating uh, are, do, ha, do they have any agency in this process or are they being just left on the side and then th something is imposed on them? Yeah, these are questions or do they understand themselves as being agents in creating a new world order? Or is this a very top down hierarchical process there where yeah, there's a huge chasm between the language of new egalitarian world order and the, the realities and practices of a neo-imperial peacemaking process. Yeah? After 1945, it's a different scenario. And so far as you have an unconditional surrender scenario, an imposed yeah, first iteration. But what I'm interested in is exactly the process that takes you from the realities of 1945 and the occupation regime in Japan and uh, Germany towards the different kind of system that results from more integrative processes. So yeah, integrating post uh, 
1945 Japan, but especially also Western, the Federal Republic of Germany, yeah? not under many, many sort of, yeah, sort of gradations of limited sovereignty, but nonetheless in instituting something like a partnership, a sharing in this new Atlantic order. Yeah? So these are very, I think, very important uh, processes that have to be illuminated then also in a global context, because what happens in this sphere yeah, is certainly not equalized or paralleled in other spheres in the in Latin America, in you know, in other parts of the world where very different conceptions, even in East Asia, yeah, if you think of the US role vis-a-vis -vis Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, it's a much more top-down, John Eikenberg calls it a kind of hub and spoke yeah, system built around bilateral relationships. There's no talk of a trans-Pacific community, or only or at least not in in the corridors of power where it really matters. Yeah. So um, what I hope to suggest then is that we we can do two things. Yeah. So <laughs> on the one hand, I wish I had the kind of capacities of Jürgen Osterhammel and the languages to write this as a truly global history. Yeah? This would be, and that would be probably far too long a book. So <laughs> instead, yeah, the, the, the attempt here is to use this Euro-Atlantic kind of huge lens already also to work out what is so problematic about the attempt of building a global order? Yeah, because there's a lot of talk about global principles and universalism, but when one analyzes where they're actually applied, yeah, and where there's more legitimacy and more support, yeah, not co not coercion, not uh, just sort of uh, imp imposition of terms, then of course you you can you can see how. How differently and uh, not a kind of American empire establishes itself, in my view, in the Euro-Atlantic sphere, but a new kind of hegemonic leader that, of course, is not a perfectly uh, sort of textbook uh, yeah, consultative power, but where you have gen generations of policymakers thinking they have to do things differently yeah, in the creation of NATO uh, and so on. Uh, finally, the epilogue of the new book yeah, sort of will cover the 1970s towards our sort of era. And of course, we'll also describe the challenges of yeah, sort of uh, declining, for example, U.S. Uh, uh, um, uh, United States in the era of the Bretton Woods dissolution and the question of how far policymakers, but also wider societies were dealing with this crisis. And then we have finally the post-1989 period. And I hope that I will deal with that on pages 1200 to 1205 so just offer a very short yeah, uh, sort of uh, outlook in in the in the next uh, uh, volume um, but i do think that um, the, the larger point here is that um, this kind of you know the the sphere of international politics that's so expanding it's a rather exciting sphere it's not some stale you know detached uh, strange practice that yeah if you if you if you went to certain conferences not so long ago you would think that this kind of history you know why do we need it anymore we live in a yeah in a, in a new sort of climate orientated or other kind of you know in a, in a world where we we should think about different things and i i I hate to say, you know, that I had no contact at all with Putin, but yeah, this in, in some ways, what many people have said before the escalation of the crisis this year is that we, we forget at our peril that it is very important to think about the main, the maintaining of security and certain rules yeah, and the mechanisms that, that we have to, yeah, to defend them if necessary. Yeah, and I think that uh, that I hope that this book can make a contribution to understanding how extremely difficult it was to create anything even approaching, yeah, we, what we might call a functioning, more or less legitimate international order, and how yeah, what the consequences can be of such orders when they collapse. Yeah, because this is a hardship that right now is not borne by people here in Washington or in Western Europe, but by those who are fighting for their lives in in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid uh, we could go on for quite a bit. We haven't even gotten to comments and questions, um, but we're out of time. Um, and I do want to keep us to uh, the 90 minutes. Um, uh, with thanks uh, to Patrick, to Gaynor, to John, to Mario, I'll turn this back over to Eric. Uh, really appreciate your uh, presentation, your responses and your questions and comments. Eric? Thanks, Christian, and thank you uh, to those joining us this afternoon. Um, please come back.
and join us next Monday, May 9th at 4 p.m. when the Washington History Seminar returns for a session on a just published book by Olivia Zuntz entitled The Man Who Understood Democracy, The Life of Alexis de Tocqueville with commentators Cheryl Welsh and Christy Pichero. We hope to see you next week. Till then, take care, be safe, good night.